Most people don't realize it because they put all this uh, propaganda out there that's natural gas, it's clean energy, that it's not going to impact. And yet fracking is impacting a lot of lands of Indigenous people that can't even hunt or drink their water anymore in their territories. And if these projects go through, it'll triple the the volumes that they will be fracking. Before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge the, uh, the territory that we are on, Slavitut, Musqueam, and Squamish territory, where we work and uh, and are privileged to have our, uh, our work take place here. Um, yeah, they, uh, the time timing of this event ended up incredibly uh, impactful um, with the movies to the climate plant and also with uh, events going on in the Unistoten camp. Uh, one of our speakers is going to talk about this a little bit later, um, but they've had a heck of a week, so I'll send over to Katie. Thanks, Peter. Um, just before we get going, uh, just to kind of ground us and why we're here, I think the, the recent ongoing wildfires in California are a really terrifying reminder that governments at all levels need to be making climate action a really serious priority. And the BC government is about to come out with a climate plan and they started releasing pieces of this and some of what they're talking about is really good, it's really needed, it's going to support a lot of jobs and the targets are not strong enough. Uh, LNG, fossil fuel extraction, has no place in a real climate plan, so we're going to talk about that a little bit later as well. And then from the perspective of, C of Sierra Club, one of the other things that's missing is that they don't count the emissions from forest management and wildfires, which is a really big gap. So that's just a bit of the context. Um, also, as Sierra Club BC, as we're shifting away from fossil fuels and towards a low carbon economy, we believe it's really important that that transition works for everybody. We're partners with uh, labor unions as part of Green Jobs BC to promote the green job alternatives um, and ensure that no one is left behind in this transition. And we also, uh, you know, as we're here today to say, to talk about our opposition to LNG and fracking, it's really important that we also talk about what we're saying yes to. So we have a, we just released a podcast this year called Mission Transition, and it's about the transition to a clean energy economy. You can listen to it on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you're not a podcast person, you can listen on the Sierra Club website. We've got flyers at the back. Um, and we're saying yes to pro-rep because jurisdictions that have proportional representation do better on environmental and climate issues. So please don't forget to vote. Uh, tonight is about learning and it's about taking action. There's going to be a couple of moments through the evening where you have a chance to pull out your phone and have your voice heard. So stay tuned for that. Um, and is there somebody from the Hive who'd like to come up and say a couple of words about this space? Maybe Peter will? Yeah, um, we'll have a moment for the Hive uh, to just introduce the space uh, while, while uh, they're making their way over the bathrooms. If anyone needs them, are to the back here and to the right there's a bathroom and then they're also outside the door. There's keys next to the door and the, the folks can help you out um, with, uh, with the keys. Um, yeah, the other, the other thing we were going to talk about tonight, I think, uh, is we really want to make the connection for people between fracking and LNG. Um, so many people think about liquefied natural gas and they don't really think about where it comes from. Um, but all of the liquefied natural gas that is proposed for these facilities would be coming from fracking fields in northeastern British Columbia. Just for LNG Canada and wood fiber, they would need 9,000 new fracking wells in the northeast of BC. Um, so it's, it's devastating, it you know, transforms landscapes and, uh, and pollutes the climate, and... Nobody's coming. So nobody's coming. Okay, uh, so I'm just going to introduce our first speaker, is uh, Elise Caron Baudouin. Um, Dr. Elise Caron Baudouin is a postdoctoral fellow at the Université de Montréal. Uh, School of Public Health at the Department of Occupational and Environmental Health under the supervision of Dr. Marc-André Benner. In 2016, she was part of a team who investigated the first Canadian biomonitoring study on exposure to contaminants related to hydraulic fracturing in pregnant women from the Peace River Valley in British Columbia. As a postdoctoral fellow, she investigates associations between density and proximity of oil and gas development and birth outcomes in northeastern BC. As a PhD candidate in the laboratory of Thomas Sanderson from INRS, she developed cellular bio, bio 
assays for the detection of endocrine disruptors. Her work is at the intersection of toxicology, endocrinology, exposure assessment, and community-based research. Elise is also a lecturer at the Université Laval and Université de Montréal, and a radio columnist. So please join me. We have Elise coming in here over Skype. All right. Well, thanks uh, everyone for the invitation. I'm I'm really happy to present you uh, some of our some of the work we've been doing in uh, in Northeast BC about exposure to uh, volatile organic compounds and trace metals in uh, during pregnancy. Um, so I'll jump right into it. Um, I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with fracking and how it's how it's done. So for the sake of time, I'll I'll just uh, jump right into the the toxicology stuff. Uh, so there's a a lot of emission sources of contaminants that are associated with hydraulic fracturing. So for example, the wastewaters that are produced during a fracking can contain volatile organic compounds, and we're gonna call them VOCs because it's, it's just a, a little quicker. Um, and also some trace metals that are naturally occurring deep down in, in the rock formation. Also the flaring, so which is the burning of natural gas that can't really be processed, uh, is also a source of uh, VOCs. And um, the use of equipment, all the trucks, uh, can also, um, of course, be a source of emission of, of VOCs. And so there are health risks, uh, especially during pregnancy, that are associated with exposure to these specific uh, contaminants. So for example, we know that exposure to certain trace metals during pregnancy is associated with reduced birth birth weight and some congenital malformations. And that exposure to benzene, which is a VOC um, during pregnancy, is also associated with reduced birth weight. And it's a known human carcinogen benzene. So its, um, it, its exposure is also associated with increased risk of childhood leukemia and uh, some uh, birth defects. Um, and in regions with intensive hydraulic fracturing activity, there's now a growing number of studies that found higher prevalence or incidence of birth defects and also uh, babies with, um, with small, uh, with uh, low birth weight. So our, our goal is to try to evaluate health impacts of environmental contaminants, for example, in the context of hydraulic fracturing. And we have a few tools that we can use to do that. Uh, one of them is toxicological studies, which is what I was doing during my PhD. Uh, and it's using animal models or cellular bioassays. And so these tools are really uh, useful to understand the toxicity mechanism of environmental contaminants, so how and how they are toxic in the organism. Uh, but they're typically performed at higher concentrations. But in the context of environmental exposure, the, um, the concentrations that we are exposed to are usually lower. So it, it is a challenge in toxicology to understand the toxicity of chronic long-term exposure to lower concentration of contaminants. Um, and also, it is hard to extrapolate the results that you can have with a, with a mouse or with a cell line to humans. So this is another challenge. Um, another tool that we have is epidemiological studies. So those studies are performed on human populations um, and they're usually, however, conducted after some health effects were observed in the communities. And uh, one of the challenges that we have in epi is that we need to correct for a lot of other factors that can can impact the health outcome that we're looking at. So age, gender, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, et cetera. So this is the challenge to really correct for all those variables um, in, a, in an adequate way. And in epi studies, we typically have no exposure assessment. So it's more association studies uh, and we don't necessarily measure contaminants in the, uh, in the thousands of participants in those big, big studies. So with that in mind and all those limitations that we have, we try to um, we try to conduct a pilot study that would that would answer some of those questions in Northeast BC. And so our objective was to evaluate um, exposure during pregnancy to volatile organic compounds and trace metals in northeastern British Columbia. And um, I also assume that many of you are familiar with that region, um, but Northeast BC sits on the Mutney Formation, which is a major natural gas source. Um, the little uh, red um, circle that you can see on the map is where we conducted the pilot study in 2016. So we recruited pregnant women in Chetwin and, and Dawson Creek. 
And uh, this region is characterized by approximately 30,000 wells that have been drilled so far for natural gas exploitation. And on this, uh, on this map, you can appreciate the extent of the development where all the little colored dots that you see are either a well or a natural gas facility. So it's a, it's a, busy, uh, it's a busy area. And so how we did this pilot study was really actually quite simple. Um, we recruited 30 pregnant women um, during one of their prenatal visit in two medical clinics located in Chetwin and Dawson Creek. And if the pregnant woman agreed to participate in the study, she signed a consent form, of course, and she answered a short questionnaire on their on their life habits, diet, um, work occupation, et cetera, et cetera. And then we, um, we sampled, so we took a hair sample and uh, urine samples, uh, and we analyzed contaminants, we measure contaminants in those samples. We took five urine samples over five consecutive days to correct for differences in day-to-day -day exposure. Um, and so what we did with those urine samples is we pulled them all together, and then we separate them in two batches. And one uh, pool was used to measure volatile organic compounds, metabolites, and the other pool was used to measure trace metals. And so for um, uh, VOCs metabolite, we measure two benzene metabolites. So a metabolite is a, is a molecule that is produced during the metabolism of, a, of benzene. When we're exposed to benzene, we're trying to get rid of it and we will metabolize it in different molecules that we will evacuate in the urines. And so this is what we measured, two benzene metabolites, SPMA and TTMA in the urine. We also measured one toluene metabolite and um, different trace metals, approximately 20 of them in hair and, um, and urine samples. And when, once we had those results, we compared the levels in the participants to some reference populations. So for benzene metabolites, we compared what we measured in pregnant women from uh, Northeast BC uh, with females who participated in the Canadian Health Measure Survey, or CHMS. Um, so it's a, it's a national initiative, um, and they take a lot of samples and they measure contaminants in uh, thousands of people. And it gives us an idea of what the general Canadian population is exposed to. Um, for uh, the trace metals that I'm going to present to you today, which are barium, aluminium, strontium, and manganese, um, we focused on those metals because they are naturally occurring in the Muntney Formation. Um, and some disruption of the rock, um, for example, with fracking, might demobilize these, um, these trace metals from deep down in the rock formation and make them more available in the groundwater system or the surface. So that's why we, we try to focus our efforts on, on those metals. But unfortunately, for most of them, they're not included in CHMS. So we compared our results to other reference ranges that were, um, that were reported by um, a colleague, uh, Goulet and colleague in 2005, that measured those same trace metals in the general population. So now with the, with the results, so just to briefly present you our participants. So half of them were recruited in Chetwin, the other half in Dawson Creek. 43% uh, of them uh, identified as indigenous and uh, two participants reported smoking at the time of recruitment and four being exposed to secondhand smoke. And this is important data because um, smoking can influence greatly uh, the concentration of this, the um, trace metals and benzene metabolites that we measured. So we had to know this information in order to understand our results at the end. Um, so what you can see here, I'll use my, my little mice. Um, so the first line is the results that we obtain in uh, the participants from Northeastern BC. And the line here is uh, what, we, what was reported in the females from the general Canadian population. And those two columns are the two benzene metabolites. So the first uh, metabolite, SPMA, we can see that our median level in the participants was slightly higher than the general population, but nothing really concerning. Um, however, when we look at the second metabolite, TTMA, um, our median level was 180 compared to 51 in the females from the general population. So it's 3.5 times higher than what we would normally expect. 
Um, and we don't really know yet the reasons of this uh, difference, but uh, we're working on it. Um, and then after those results, we compare the levels of benzene metabolites between a region of recruitment, so Chetwin and Dawson Creek, uh, and between the indigenous and non-indigenous participants. And so I'll just present you this, this graph between the levels of, it shows the levels of TTMA between the indigenous and non-indigenous participants. And you can see that levels um, of TT, the median level in indigenous participant was, uh, was higher than in non-indigenous participants. And the line that you see here, the first line, uh, represent the median level in the general population. So you can see that a great deal of our participants had TTMA level uh, over uh, the median level in, in the general population. So now just some briefly uh, results about trace metals. So we measured them in urine. This is the first graph. And in hair samples, this is the second graph. And we compared our results to uh, reference ranges reported by uh, other colleagues in the general population. So our results are the um, are the black uh, bars. And uh, you can see in urine and in hair, but it's it's most it's more striking in hair samples that the levels of barium, aluminum, strontium, as well as manganese um, were higher, seems to be higher in the participants that we recruited in 2016 compared to, again, what we would expect in, in the general population. Um, and again, for trace metals, we also compared uh, levels between the regions of recruitment and between indigenous and non-indigenous participants. And what we can see is that levels of barium and strontium were higher um, in indigenous participants compared to non-indigenous participants. So um, before we go to the conclusions of this pilot study, it's, uh, it's a small study and it has several limitations and it's important to note them and, and acknowledge them. So first of all, it's a really small number of participants. We have uh, 29 participants that completed the whole thing. So it, it's, of course, not a lot of people. Um, another limitation that we have is that levels of TTMA, which is the second benzene metabolite that I presented you, can be influenced by other factors uh, than benzene exposure. For example, um, if we consume a lot of transformed food that contains sorbic acid, sorbic acid is a very common food preservative. Um, actually, sorbic acid is also metabolized in TTMA. So, of course, a diet is, uh, can influence TTMA levels, which can be a confounding factor. Um, another limitation that we have is we did not measure the contaminants in, in, partic in the participants' environment, for example, indoor air and tap water, which would have given us a, a, better, under, a better picture of the levels of exposure and the sources of exposure. And the reference population for trace metals, um, maybe I have a potential different baseline exposure, so it might not be the best comparison group, but unfortunately, it it's what's available in the literature for now. Um, so just a few conclusions about our pilot study. Uh, so what we can say for sure is that the levels of TTMA, which is a urinary metabolite of benzene, were higher in, in those participants when we compare to the Canadian general population. And in indigenous participants, the median level of TTMA was six times higher. Um, air levels of barium, aluminum, strontium, and manganese were also higher in the participants from our pilot study compared to the reference um, ranges reported by uh, the study by Goulet. Um, and um, again, we're, we're trying to figure out exactly where, um, where these uh, metals come from, but uh, hydraulic fracturing might be uh, a potential exposure source. And uh, hair levels of, of barium and strontium were also higher in indigenous participants compared to um, non-indigenous participants. So, of course, for us, these results uh, raised concern about uh, exposure to benzene and trace metals, and especially in, in indigenous communities. And, and we're trying to really uh, figure out what's happening there to, to better, be able to better explain the results that, that we have so far. So the good news is that uh, this pilot study uh, raised the concerns not only for us, uh, but for others. And so we have a, a new study that will start next year, uh, which is called Experiva Exposures in the Peace River Valley. And it's funded uh, for four years by a CIHR. So we're happy to, to be back and try to um, 
to recruit more pregnant women and, uh, and uh, also measure contaminants, not only in hair and urine, but also in their tap water and indoor air to really better understand the sources of exposure and the levels of exposure. And I want to th take a few seconds just to um, make some acknowledgements. Of course, the participants for the pilot study, the medical clinics that were of a tremendous help, uh, the PI on this project, Marc-André Werner, and all our uh, academic co collaborators, uh, my intern, which was also very helpful. And it the pilot study, as well as the Experva uh, study, um, uh, was designed uh, in partnership with the Treaty 8 Tribal Association, West Moberly First Nations, and Soto First Nations. So we're partners with, uh, with them for those studies. And of course, I thank them for welcoming me on their traditional territory uh, so many times. And um, I don't know if we have time for a question, but if we do not, uh, or if you wish to talk about this further, uh, you can see my email right, this, right there on this slide. So please feel free to contact me and I'll be happy to discuss this further with everyone who's, uh, who's interested in that. So thank you. thank you. For undertaking this very important research, um, the conclusions that you've reached are pretty staggering. And so I think it's good to follow our conversation. Um, well, uh, and also thank you for joining us from Montreal at uh, a very late hour for release. <laughs> uh, so we'll start right into questions. Uh, we've got time for a couple here. Um, going in the back. What we'll do is we'll, we'll get you to ask a very brief question and then we'll repeat it for Elise. Yeah, you can say that. Yeah, please, because I can't hear you super well. <laughs> Are there any equivalent studies in, uh, in, from the U.S. for the Bakken, the Eagle Ford, and other uh, fracking fields uh, have at least as high concentrations of these chemicals? So the question is, is there a comparable research in the U.S. over the Bakken Foundation? The Bakken Fields. Bakken Fields. In North Dakota. In North Dakota. And, uh, Eagle Ford, Texas. And Eagle Ford in Texas. So if there is a comparable studies done in the U.S., like something like we've done in the pilot study? Okay. Um, so to our knowledge, um, no. Uh, we believe this is the first biomonitoring study um, regarding contaminants that uh, might be associated with fracking that is published in uh, that is published in the scientific literature. There was one a small pilot study that was done um, a few years ago in Wyoming, and um, what they did is they recruited ten persons, ten uh, ten participants, and they measured the same uh, benzene metabolites than us in urine, and they also had um, personal air monitors. Uh, where they measured benzene in ambient air of the of the participants, and they found a similar results than us, so really high levels of TTMA, and it was correlated with uh, high levels of benzene in in the ambient air of the participants. But it was such a small study with ten participants that it was not. Uh, it was published as a report. You can actually find it online uh, it, on a PDF. Um, I can send it to, to you if you're interested. Uh, but it was not published like in a scientific peer-reviewed paper. So I think we're the first to do that, if I'm not mistaken. Great. Um, so the next uh, portion that we were going to do, uh, we mentioned that this was an interactive uh, experience here. Um, and so with the Wilderness Committee, one of our big pushes right now is we've got a petition to ban fracking. And so I'm going to explain a little bit of it, but I'm actually going to give you guys a little bit of time to take out your phones and go to banfrackingbc.ca. Uh, so the government, where they're at in fracking, uh, in reviewing fracking at the moment, is they came up with this review that has just absurdly um, close uh, what's the word? Boundaries. <laughs> um, and and there's scientists that are exploring, you know, these really couple things, and it's kind of a review that's designed in order to um, to prevent us from finding out what's going on with fracking. And so, the Wilderness Committee, after the government comes out with their report in January, plans to uh, deliver our petition of over 10,000 people to the provincial government, asking to ban fracking in British Columbia. Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a big ask, and we think that the research that is just becoming more clear every day um, shows that fracking is an unacceptable thing to be allowing in our province, and that we can move on to different sources of energy uh, in a very 
fast and uh, and important way. Um, so everybody is taking a little a moment just to fill in the petition. Uh, we also have for folks who don't have. Um, their phones handy. We have some paper petitions, and if anyone is really keen, Chloe has uh, some fracking packages that you can go and take some of our petitions home with you. Yeah, get them signed up at your workplace, and um, and uh, mail them back to us. So we've got everything there together. If, if there's anyone that's really interested, that's good. Uh, so the address is banfrackingbc.ca. Uh, but. Timing. Excellent. So we've uh, we've wrapped the, the petition. I'm going to pass it off to Caitlin here, who's going to introduce uh, next speaker. Thanks, Peter. Um, so we're going to move now. Well, actually, first of all, I forgot to thank Zoe Yunker, who's been working with us and did a lot of the organizing for this event. So we thank you, Zoe, for that. Um, we're going to move now from the fracking fields in the northeast down along. Uh, where the proposed natural gas pipeline would bring fracked gas to the LNG Canada terminal in Kitimat. Um, and there's one man in Smithers who has launched a jurisdictional challenge to get in the way of that pipeline. And so we're really lucky to have Michael Sawyer with us tonight uh, down from Smithers. Mike has been an oil and gas activist since 1982 when he was gassed in the Shell Canada burnt timber field while operating a whitewater rafting company that he owned. Since then, he's been directly involved in over 25 regulatory hearings in front of the National Energy Board, the Alberta Energy Regulator, and several joint review panels. For example, the East Coast Sable Island Joint Review Panel, with a focus on critically reviewing sour gas wells gas plant and pipeline applications with a focus on upstream cumulative effects. This is a guy who knows what he's talking about. Mike has a master's degree in environmental science from the Faculty of Environmental Design at University of Calgary and over 24 years of professional experience working for both industry and individuals, First Nations and Angos who found themselves in conflict with big oil. He's taken various governments to court and most recently successful, successfully challenged the Prince Rupert LNG pipeline that was to supply natural gas to the now cancelled Patronas LNG project. Uh, and that was at the Federal Court of Appeal. He's currently challenging, like I mentioned, the Coastal Gas Link pipeline, which would be the supply pipeline for LNG Canada. Uh, and this is currently in front of the National Energy Board. He's an acknowledged expert on Canadian oil and gas matters and upstream cumulative effects. Um, he's been getting a lot of flack for his position around this pipeline. Sierra Club BC has, applies to, has applied to the National Energy Board to intervene on his behalf, as has the Wilderness Committee. And we're so grateful that he's taking the stand and that he could join us tonight. Please welcome Mike. Thank you. I, I'm, I, I'm almost feeling tired just listening to that description. <laughs> like, how the hell did I ever do all that? Anyway, um, I've only got a short period of time, and, it, and, it, and it's a super complex uh, story. I could spend several hours up here talking to you, so I'm, I'm just going to hit a few highlights. And uh, I was going to start out by telling you what I'm doing, uh, and, and then tell you why I'm doing it. Thank you. And uh, I, I've decided I'm going to switch it around. I'm going to talk about why I'm doing it before I tell you what I'm doing. And because that ties directly into, sorry. It's not on anything. Is that on? My apologies. No, that's off. <laughs> <laughs> Can you turn it up a little bit? Somebody on the board. How's that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I usually speak without the mic, but uh, I read an article the other day how that's actually, you know, condescending to people who can't hear, which, which I'm not of, so. Um, we're, we're here to talk about LNG and fracking. And, and what I'd like to do is, is sort of broaden our uh, understanding of the environmental costs associated with producing natural gas, whether it's for LNG or, or just general consumption, there's this, uh, this notion that the gas industry and governments have perpetrated for at least the last 50, 60 years that, that natural gas is an environmentally friendly 
bridging fuel to some mythical future energy source. And, and that's a lie. Uh, I like to call it the big lie. And I want to imprint on your minds that whenever we're talking about natural gas as an energy source, that it is not environmentally friendly. There are a whole host of environmental uh, costs. And while it is part of the energy mix that we're gonna use for the foreseeable future, we need to be alive and aware of what all those costs are so we can, as a society, make intelligent decisions about how to meet our current and future energy needs and uh, you know how to deal with some of the, 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 the more problematic problems. So you might say, well, why do I call it the big line? And, and uh, to, to um, put that into focus, if we go back a few weeks ago when LNG Canada announced their final investment decision, and both our, our Premier and our Prime Minister um, were almost wetting themselves with glee that they could stand up and announce this big $40 billion capital project. And both leaders said, this is good for the environment. This project is great for the environment. In fact, the Prime Minister said that it would result in a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Now that was a lie, and, and I'm sure Justin knew it. And, and it's a bit of a sleight of hand, because if you actually look at the, the emissions from natural gas at the burner tip, in comparison to the emissions from coal at the burner tip, yes, natural gas is about 50% of the uh, burner tip emissions. And that's the source of the, this 40 or 50 year long mythology is that at the burner tip. But if we actually do a life cycle analysis that looks at all of the costs in the exploration, the, 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 the drilling of the wells, the producing of the wells, the shipping of the gas, the reprocessing of the gas uh, for LNG, shipping that LNG to China and then reconstitute it and then burning it. The research shows that, that the actual life cycle emission costs on gas is, uh, depending on which study you look at, is between 2 to 27 percent worse than coal. So, and, and, and we're just talking about greenhouse gas emissions, and I'm not going to go into it a lot because we're going to have more uh, on that later. But if we talk about um, the fracking impacts, we talk about the the impacts on, on fisheries, we talk about the impacts on uh, wildlife and endangered species, if we talk about the impacts on local populations, e example some of these health studies, if we talk about the impacts on indigenous people and their abilities to use those lands, if we talk about the impacts on, on our democracy because of the heavy, heavy influence that the oil and gas industry has, and, and I'll guarantee you that I'm sure there's some people in here who are quite influential in your own community, but I doubt there's anyone here, unless there's a plant from the oil and gas industry, who could phone up, phone up the Premier's office and get straight through to the, to the uh, a minister or a better. I can't do it, but they can. And they can because they donate, they donate so much money that it, 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 it has a, a big impact on our democracy. And so that is one of the impacts. A dysfunctional democracy is one of the impacts of, of natural gas. And of course that leads to more bad decisions that don't take into consideration the full life cycle costs. And so when, when we're talking about fracking, that's one impact, but there's a whole host of other impacts that, that undermine the big lie. And so I just want to make sure that when people are thinking about this, you try to think about it holistically, that it's not just endangered species, it's not just um, fracking, but it's the whole industry it is, and, and the notion that this is an environmentally friendly fuel is predicated on easily, easily challenged um, assumptions that are just wrong. And, and I, uh, to put that into context, let me uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, last year I participated in a National Energy Board hearing in Dawson Creek over the, uh, I'll just let that pass. And I, and I, I did want to modify my, my introduction a little bit because I've been labeled as the most hated man in Northern BC. And uh, if I was in Northern BC and I heard the sirens, I'd be a little twitchy, but I'm, I'm in Southern BC. I'm, I'm glad you saw that as humor. But, um, so I participated in this hearing on, on, on the North Montney Pipeline application in front of the National Energy Board. And I was primarily there to, to raise issues about upstream cumulative effects. 
and, and I was particularly interested in, in that pipeline because it will feed into these LNG export projects. And that pipeline is also coming from the North Montney field, which we, we've heard some discussion about the toxicology from that. And what I found interesting about it was that uh, when we tried to make the argument, and, and some of the, the First Nations communities made the same argument, that the upstream cumulative effects were having a very big effect, both the company and the National Institute Board said, we're only looking at a, a steady area a thousand meters at either side of the pipeline. And if it falls outside of that, it's outside of our scope. And they did get their hands slapped a little bit on the Trans Mountain over the same kind of a strategy. But the, the point is that um, that pipeline goes through some areas that have endangered uh, caribou populations. Uh, those populations, and, and, and um, uh, one of them in particular has, when they started doing systematic population surveys in 1986 until the last one in 2016, the population had dropped by 82 percent, and, uh, and and that was on a relatively limited number of wells in their, you know, in their in their habitat. When we, and based on Trans Canada's own evidence, that in order to fill that pipeline for the next 30 years, you're going to have to drill 700 new wells a year, and those will all be fracking wells, and they'll all be uh, wells that have all the other impacts that would go with it. For 30 years, that means that they're going to be. This is their evidence that they're going to have to drill 21,000 more wells in an area where the caribou have already declined by 82 percent. So that means that those caribou who are theoretically protected by the Federal Species at Risk Act will get snuffed out. And and so um, you know it, that that is an impact of the oil and gas. And so. How can we as a society with a straight face say that natural gas is an environmentally friendly fuel? We can say it if we limit our discussion just to burner tin. We cannot say it if we actually look at the life cycle costs. And, and so I, that's the kind of key message I want people to go away with. Um, as far as what I've done, uh, I've, I've given you some of the background why I'm doing it. Um, but the, the real reason I'm doing it is, it, to put it bluntly, is rage. It's, it's, it, I'm so pissed off at what the governments and the corporations uh, have done to uh, undermine our democratic decision making that, uh, you know, I, 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 I just, I'm really angry about it. And I know I don't show it, but I am. Um, and, and so a couple years ago, because I have a history in oil and gas uh, coming from Alberta and having worked both sides of the fence, and at the time I was the uh, acting chair of the local resource, community resources board, and TransCanada came with their dog and pony show to convince us that the pipeline was really a good pipeline. Uh, I asked a, a couple of questions, and one of the questions I asked is, well, where does your pipeline hook into? And they wouldn't tell me, they said, well, we'll get back to you, they never did. And, and so the key, and I'll go back to my, my challenge with the Prince Rupert pipeline. Um, under normal constitutional law, under the Constitution, natural resource how much time do I have? It's only eight Okay, we're, we're doing good. Um, I, under the Constitution, I, I, uh, natural resource projects are in the exclusive jurisdiction of the province. And so a pipeline that, that starts in the province and ends in the province would normally be provincially regulated. And that's what they did. And so they, they put it through the BC Environmental Assessment Office and they put it through the BC Oil and Gas Commission. And, and not surprisingly, those were approved because that was in the context of the previous government uh, politically heavily invested in LNG, and, and it comes as no surprise that a closed door uh, approach would result in approval. The problem is that there are some circumstances when a, when a otherwise provincially regulated pipeline would get dragged into the federal jurisdiction, and, and that was determined through a, a Supreme Court of Canada decision in 1998 called the West Coast decision, and basically what the Supreme Court said was that if the provincial pipeline is functionally integrated into a federal pipeline, then it becomes an extension of the federal pipeline at, rather than a standalone project. And, and without going into the, the full legal test that the Supreme Court um, came up with, the Prince Rupert LNG pro pipeline project was, you know, met all the criteria. And I made that argument to the board. The board told me to go, they basically told me to take a leave. 
uh, I, and with the help from uh, a bunch of people, including uh, West Coast Environmental Law and others, I took them to the Federal Court of Appeal and won. And shortly after I won that appeal, uh, the project was canceled. And, and truthfully, you know, a lot of people said I was the dragon slayer. Uh, that's not true. These things always get killed on economic criteria. And so I might have been a straw on the camel's back, but that, that's, that's the most I could take credit for. But then I took that and I looked at the, the, the current project, uh, Coastal Gas Link, which is the supply line to LNG Canada, which is the largest capital development project in Canadian history outside of government projects. So I mean, this is a big deal, $40 billion. And, and, and all of the criteria that the Supreme Court identified and that I used in my uh, Prince Rupert case are, are exactly the same. Same ownership, same purpose, all the criteria match. So I, I filed an application with the National Energy Board to have them look at the jurisdictional question. Um, and it's a multi-stage process and I won't get into all the details, but I'll just say that they we won the first couple rounds and they have now determined they are going to have a jurisdictional hearing uh, sometime in the next few months. Um, and, and so we're making good progress. The, what, what's interesting is that if I'm right, and I think I'm on pretty solid legal grounds, that will mean that the provincial permits for that pipeline will be voided, and that they will have to go back to the federal government and reapply for permits under the federal legislation. Now, the Canadian environmental assessment legislation isn't as good as we might want it to be, but it's a lot better than what the provincial legislation is. And, and, and it opens up a whole set of different assessment criteria that the provincial legislation doesn't have. So the, at the end game is if, if I'm correct and, and if I'm a little bit lucky, um, we will see it be going to a, a federal review. And, and my one fear in all of this, uh, other than having my tires slashed, um, is that I'll, I'll, I'll work through this, and this has been about a five year process so far, and we'll get it to a federal review, and I'll charge ahead into the federal review, and I'll look over my shoulder and there'll be no one standing behind me. And, and I don't think that's gonna happen now because we're starting to get some traction with, with people like this Sierra Club and, the, and the, the Wilderness Committee and others, but if we get the opportunity to have a second kick of the can in terms of trying to determine whether or not LNG Canada and Coastal Gas Lake are truly in the public interest, if we consider the full life cycle costs, um, then when that opportunity comes up, everyone who is concerned about any one of the issues that gets rolled into this big ball uh, will have an opportunity to uh, have their say. And we could influence, uh, if we're lucky, uh, the direction that, that uh, public policy is taking, whether it be about fracking, um, endangered species, greenhouse gases, any of the above. So I'm uh, just about to get dragged off because I've used up my 13 minutes and so I'm going to leave it at that. Um, do we have time for questions now or are we going to do that later? No. You mentioned a term I hadn't heard before. It was either bird tip or burger tip. Can you explain what you mean, please? So, so very quickly, when you burn a, uh, a, a fossil fuel or a hydrocarbon, um, through that chemical process, you convert that into energy and some uh, emissions, including carbon dioxide and other things. And so when we talk about burner tip emissions, that would be, with respect to natural gas, would be if we took a unit of natural gas that had already been cleaned out, all the waste materials were out of it, and we burn it at the burner tip, how much, uh, how much emissions would it emit for a given unit of energy? And, and if, we, if we compare that to other fuel choices, like coal, for example, or like diesel fuel, then we can come up with a, a, a direct comparison about for a unit of energy, what are the emissions? What I'm suggesting is we need to back away from talking about burner tips and, and talk about the full life cycle costs so that we can really tell, ha make intelligent decisions about our energy choices. <coughs> did, that, did that help? Yeah, that helps. Thank you very much. And I agree with you. I don't think the mic will go, so. Okay. Yeah. Speak up. Yeah. Um, so you talked a bit about the influence of the oil and gas 
industry on our democracy in BC. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that and the next steps. I mean, we uh, successfully banned big money in BC, which is awesome. Um, and so I'm wondering, what are the next steps? Where else, how else does the oil and gas industry influence democracy? What do we need to do? Um, that's, uh, that's a very good question. I, I'm, I'm probably not the most qualified person to answer that question. I, I personally believe that it's a lot more complex than that. I, I think we have problems with our economic system. I think we're, we're uh, this is kind of outside the scope of my talk, but I, I, think, our, I think we're looking at a, a, a failed experiment with, with uh, capitalism. I, I think we're sort of morphing into a very fascist type of uh, uh, worldview, and, and I don't actually have the answer. I, I think the fact that if we become aware of these problems as citizens, and we, we become more insistent in demanding that that uh, we actually have a functional democracy, which currently I don't think we do, that is a step in the right direction. What the end game is, we could we could talk about it for hours and hours, and I, I don't know if we come up with the right answer. I think we're gonna cut questions for now, and then there's more time at the end for more questions. And to Mike for um, coming down from the north to share his, his insights and what he's doing, and his rage, because frankly, rage is entirely warranted right now. And so for channeling that rage into a legal wrench that really gives us a chance to delay and hopefully hopefully make a difference. So thank you so much to Mike. Uh, we're going to transition gears and show a six minute video uh, made by the Wet'suwet'en hereditary leaders about their opposition to LNG pipelines in their territory. I was talking with uh, Chief Namax earlier this week and he sent it down. Um, with a reminder that when we talk about the Wet'suwet'en Nation, that these are the hereditary leaders of the Wet'suwet'en Nation, and that that is to be differentiated from the Wet'suwet'en First Nation, which is the band council system under the Canadian Indian Act. So these are the Wet'suwet'en Nation hereditary chiefs uh, and their position on LNG. The Ralgamuk Stayway court case, the Kala court case, which I am the house chief of, and also the Nicol case, all those cases we won. And through that, those three, we told the world who we are, how we looked after our land, and who are the true caretakers of the land. And yet, the governments and industry are still dancing around that. This is our territory right here. Talbitzkwa. Provincial and federal officials and all elected officials only have assumed and presumed authority over the Wet'suwet'en territory. 
the territory, the Yinta, the land, the air, the water, that all belongs to the Wet'suwet'en people. We've never ceded nor surrendered nor signed a treaty to give away any of that authority to anybody. So if there are decisions to be made on our land, it is our decision and nobody else's. My parents, my grandparents told me when I was very young, they say, don't ever let anybody pull the wool over your eyes when you, when you get older. I said, we never signed nothing. This land is still yours to protect. And that's the way I've looked at it all my life. There's no such thing as Crown land in my books because we never signed the land to nobody. Uh, it still belongs to us, the First Nation. You know, the province of uh, British Columbia and uh, the federal government, they talk about reconciliation. When they talk about reconciliation and they undermine their own words by trying to shove pipelines down our throat or industry down our throat and it's just not the way we do business. There will be no pipeline to enter Wet'suwet'en territory. The decision-making powers for traditional territories lie with us, the hereditary chiefs. We've gone to the highest courts of Canada to prove our title and our responsibilities and our ability to be the authority of these territories. The provinces and the federal government have decided that they don't want to deal with us, that they would rather go to people who are willing to say yes to them. And we're sick and tired of that. We have to stand up for our traditional territories. We have to make sure that we are the ones that make the decisions on them. If we say no to any kind of development because it would impede on our ability to take care of our future generations, then that's going to be the answer. The authority of a, a hereditary chief comes uh, exactly that, through the hereditary system. It's not by election, it's, uh, it's by consensus of the clan members that, uh, that put you into this position. The position takes us into speaking in the feast hall with authority, with the, all of the clan members and your clan in mind and uh, a, a total trust that we're uh, acting on the best behalf of our clan and our nation. We have to think about the land, we have to think about the water, we think about the uh, air, the animals, and uh, a lot of the authority that we have is that, uh, that we make sure that uh, there's an abundance of ways that we can live off the, off the land. And uh, today it's being threatened and a uh, majority of our people are, are not agreeing with the, the fact that uh, gas and the gas pipeline um, is a good thing for our Wet'suwet'en people. To our next speaker, um, who was in the video, as you probably know, uh, I have the great pleasure to introduce Frida Hisong uh, of the Unistoten uh, clan. Uh, Frida was chosen to be the spokesperson for the Unistoten clan in 2008 when the Unistoten separated from the tribal organization called the Offices of the Wet'suwet'en of the Wet'suwet'en. Her responsibilities as a spokesperson include holding meetings between her hereditary clan chiefs, performing liaison duties with the industry and government, coordinating messages for media, and researching all aspects of which are brought up for discussion regarding clan business. Much of her grounding comes from being raised following the seasonal hunting and fishing on her people's lands and waterways. Some of her responsibilities continue to include planning and coordinating clan incursions out to their traditional territories. Frida's guiding philosophy is based on teachings taught to her and her family from her great-grandmother, the late Christine Holland. And I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce her great-grandmother's name, but maybe you can help us out at uh, the intro. Here to speak to you about what we're doing on our territory and the, Christine's name was Nettie Beast and that name was now passed down, to, it was passed down to my auntie Sarah Layton and now my uncle holds the name so he's the successor and our names have been passed down for thousands of years so Nettie Beast Sarah Layton was actually one of the plaintiffs in the Delgamu, so to prove that we had title and rights to our lands. And 
right now there is proposed uh, fracking pipelines for our territory. And as most of you have heard that the LNG project was approved and they got all their investors. And even though they didn't consult the right people, which is the hereditary system, as you've heard Namok speak earlier, he's actually the one of the hereditary chiefs for the Tsayu clan. And we have five clans, which uh, through our governance structure is our feast hall. And the clans have stood up showing their support to Unistat then on, I think it was a while back that we made an announcement that we would not permit any of these pipelines through our traditional territory for the reason being that this is where our salmon spawn, and it's one of the only clean rivers that you can still drink the water. And Christine Holland lived to be 113 years old, and she trained up her grandchildren on how to manage and protect the lands and to ensure that it would be there for the next generations. and. I'm one of the next generations and my children and my grandchildren will be the next generations because we're matrilineal and we follow our mothers. So matrilineal, matrilineally, we're connected to the lands and territories that come with the name and native beasts and some of the other chief names hold names that have territories connected to it. And when they went to Del Gamu, they proved in court that their oral history on how they were connected to those lands was in, enough to prove that they had a connection to these lands and these lands belonged to them and to their clan members. And Del Gamu stated the uh, the chief name, for example, Hunistat then would be Nettie Beast and members, which would include myself and all my aunties, my uncles, everybody that falls under the Hunistat then clan. And so we've been corresponding with industry and government saying that we don't approve of these projects and stating the reasons why. And so they created a Bill C-51 where it'll make a criminal for people like myself from blocking what they call their critical infrastructures, their pipeline projects, even though we have title and rights to our land and the land, the water, the air, the animals, and the clean drinking water is our critical infrastructure. And the sad thing is that most of... Uh, like the RCMP, they basically are there for the industry, even though they say they're not. They're there just to keep the peace, they continue to say. But three years ago, when they first tried to access our territory and we wouldn't permit them access because they couldn't answer our protocol questions, and every person that is not UNISAT then that comes to the bridge, we do protocol questions and ask them, who are you? Where are you from? How long do you plan to stay for let you in? Do you work for industry or government that's destroying our lands? And what kind of skills will you bring? And how will your visit benefit UNISAT then? And most of the industries can't answer those questions. So they end up getting turned away. So, We've been living there for 10 years, and I know people have got accustomed to calling it Hunistat Den Camp, because originally that's just the name that happened to stick because we had, um, we held camps annually, and that's basically what they're calling the camp is like we have the nonviolent direct action training camps that we ran annually, and it was called Unistat Den Camp, so that name tend to stick, but it's actually a homestead because we've been living there for over eight years, and what we call it is occupation. We're reoccupying our lands that we were forced off to and put onto reservations, but we realized that we could not protect our territory from the reservations, so because industry kept trying to go in behind our backs, even though we've had told them numerous times that no, that we don't approve of their projects. So they would, whenever we're busy 
burying family members, they somehow know probably social media, who knows, but they somehow got inside information that we're busy with a burial and which usually takes up to a week. And each time that I've lost the family member, industry approached the bridge and try to come in. So that's the kind of tactics they use. And they showed up at the bridge two days ago again, asking permission for permission to access our territory. And again, they probably know that Smogaskem's mom is in palliative care. So we've been busy with her and taking care of her and being by her side while she's taking this journey. And again, they try to access the territory. So it just shows how ruthless they are and they don't care about anybody else, but their bottom line, their dollar, what they can make out of this project. And the sad fact is that these projects aren't going to benefit Canada because they're planning to export these to Asia and they claim that it's going to reduce the coal emissions in Asia. But in the meanwhile, they're doing fracking in Canada, which has increased the pollution and, and they're not keeping within the, the measures that they're supposed to, to not pollute the environment. And most people don't realize it because they put all this uh, propaganda out there that's natural gas, it's clean energy, that it's not gonna impact. And yet fracking is impacting a lot of lands of indigenous people that can't even hunt or drink their water anymore in their territories. And if these projects go through, it'll triple the, the volumes that they will be fracking and all waters are connected. So it's not just the people that are living in the fracking, we're all impacted by it because all our waters are connected and goes from streams to creeks to rivers and then the rivers flow into the ocean. So all of us are impacted by these projects and they don't seem to care that we are here and we're not going anywhere and industry will come and go, but we're the ones that would have to live with the mess. So that's why my family has made the choice to stand firm and keep telling industry that they can't come in. And we were forced to put a, actually double gate the first gate is a wooden gate and because uh, we were having people trying to walk in and vandalizing our outbuildings and also the police trying to just walk in and force their way so we put a pedestrian gate and a, a gate so that vehicles can't just come in we have to unlock the gate to allow people and they have to answer your protocols questions to get in and so now we, we realized that we were, felt like we were standing alone and we're wondering why not, even though a lot of people vocalize that they support what we're doing and vocalize that they don't want these projects, people weren't coming up to, to the camp to be there with us. So we thought that because of the forced onto reservations that a lot of people were oppressed and depressed and they're too busy worrying about their day to day, whether where they're gonna get their food or how they're gonna put a roof over their head that, and a lot of them are living in crisis mode because of all the trauma and everything else that comes to in living in small tracts of land when our people used to freely roam all the 22,000 square kilometers of our territory. And it's just like we're imprisoned onto reservations. So of course our people are gonna be oppressed and of course they're gonna be struggling with substance abuse and a lot of people living in poverty and industry and government has used those poverty levels to throw a carrot to the band councils, which band council are my, like municipalities, they have a boundary in the area in which they, they administrate. And so they don't have jurisdictions outside the reservations. Um, Delgamuf, where the five chief, uh, 13 house chiefs stood up in court and told their oral testimony, showing how they were connected to their lands and how those territories they had used for thousands of years before colonization and had never ceded or surrendered those lands. And 
Nowhere in Delgamook does it say that the territories belong to band councils or tribal councils and it named the 13 Wet'suwet'en chiefs and their house members and they did that a joint effort with the Gixan chiefs. So they took that to the provincial courts and then they weren't successful there and then they took it to the Supreme Court and in 1987 they were successful in proving that those territories did in fact belong to our Wet'suwet'en people. And so yeah, that's what we've been doing. And so far we've been successful in shutting down Enbridge and Pacific Trails has backed off. And right now we're contending with the Coastal Gas Link project since that got approved and they're still sending us letters and pretty much ignoring our no. So, so that's where we're at now. And because we couldn't get our people involved, we had a long-term vision of building a healing center. So we basically have a big community out where I live now. I live in a log cabin and we built a bunkhouse that sleeps about 20 people to house our visitors. And my niece graduated with her PhD in clinical psychology and it was her long-term vision to build a healing center so we could bring our Wet'suwet'en and people out to the land and give them holistic healing, cultural spiritual, mental, so that be fully, totally connected to the land and receive healing and that way they would be more successful. And we thought it was a long-term vision and a lot of supports that were there that helped us build the bunkhouse came forward. And within three years, we actually have a healing center now that's got a commercial kitchen, dining room, counseling rooms, meeting rooms, and sleeping quarters. So we did that in three phases and we just doing finishing touches now. So we have pretty much a big community and we don't like people calling it Unistata and Camp because it's actually a Unistata and Homestead and it's to encourage our people to get back to the territories and reconnect to the land so that we can protect them and work the land and protect it not only for our future generations, but for all the animals that are out on the territory and especially our water because water is life and without that water none of us would survive so that's one of the only clean waters we still have left and that's where our salmon salmon spawn and we're salmon people so but that's pretty much what we've all been like it's been pretty busy it's I'm pretty much a volunteer I've been doing this for many years and it's not a paid position and I always just look at it that it's an investment for our next generations and for the future of our children and grandchildren and not only my people but the rest of the planet because this impacts everybody these projects. Thank you so much for your words uh, Frida and, and thank you for joining us. I know you've had a heck of a week and uh, it just means a lot that you can be here here with us. Uh, before we get to questions I did just want to mention uh, Letizia from uh, Unistoten Solidarity Brigade is just going to pass a hat. Um, you know, the Unistoten have put the call out for folks to come up to um, the, uh, their territory, and they are, uh, that means more bodies, but also um, donations are needed. So um, while Latuzi passes the hat, we'll just get into questions. Put the back there, and maybe I'll just repeat after you. Um, I'm talking on behalf of the uh, CAPE, the Canadian Association for Physicians for the Environment. And we recently did a tour of northeastern BC, talked to uh, uh, First Nations up there uh, and uh, farmers up there. And they, a lot of them felt like they're being abandoned by the rest of the province. That people down here might get excited over Kinder Morgan, but they're not really that helpful or supportive in terms of what's going on up north. And I, I think you're doing an amazing job. Um, and you're fighting the good fight for all of us. And my question is, what can we do in the South to help you further your aims um, in, in your indigenous territory? Great, thanks for that question, uh, Frida. Just for you, the question is, what can we do in the South in order to uh, support you and further your aims in your territory? Probably educating other people that these projects, even though they're up North, do impact everybody because all the waters are connected and educating people and about what fracking does and just uh, tell people what we're about. Uh, not, not everybody was at your event there, but 
and support whatever way you can, having little kitchens and your home and inviting people, showing videos on what we were doing and just show your support in whatever way you can because there's all kinds of ways you can support, whether it be fundraising financially or even just using your voice to host events and talk about the impacts of fracking and even doing research on all these investors and putting pressure on them because even though we try to put pressure on them, they still made their investments. So, and just mainly just getting it out there to the public and share, share, share all the videos that are out there to educate people. Because that's usually what it takes. It takes educating and we've reached a lot of people over the years. And so that's usually what it takes is uh, people power. So the more people that are on board and educating others and answering questions they might have. And especially if people have been up to our territory, they can talk about what's all there and the beauty. And like I said, a lot of people also have received healing coming to the being out on the land. So just whatever ways they can help. Even if you can't come up, you can help from right where you're at. Is there another question? Right there. Uh, hi, Frida. Thanks so much for all your work. Um, I don't know how to word it exactly, but I'm wondering if you can reiterate and sort of clarify how the federal government is making it so that they can do this. Sorry, it's, I don't know how to say it. Like legally, you use the term. So even though Demel Camus was one and you, you proven that. So it's for the greater good or something like that? Like, I'm just, sorry, I don't even have the language. The justifications? But I yeah, the justifications. How do they legally say they can come onto your traditional territory after you've won that law? Legal sure. Uh, so this question is a legal one. Um, after Delgamok, uh what is the justification, the yeah. legal justification that the federal government is using to continue to come onto your lands and um, and approve projects there? From what we've been told, that what they're doing is illegal because we've never ceded or surrendered our land and what they're doing is trying to skirt around the hereditary chiefs who have proven in court that they have a connection to these lands and a while back uh, they did a land use study and pretty much 100% of those chiefs at that time said no to the projects and stated all the reasons why these projects can't happen. And so what they did is they just shelved that study and started going to look for some yes people and for some strange reasons, a while back, as far as I can remember, when I worked for the my band, it's under the federal jurisdiction. And every time we tried to apply for provincial funding, they always said that we're federal, so we can't access provincial funding. And now all of a sudden, the province is putting 60% of the funds of these investors to encourage partnerships with bands. And so here we have province putting money forward for federal bands to sign on in these partnerships. And that's what we call the divide and conquer. And we don't blame our bands for signing these deals, even though they don't have the jurisdiction. We just keep standing firm to Delgamu. And we got told by one of the Delgamu lawyers a while back when we questioned what would happen. If we keep doing what we're doing, an industry shows up and tries to do an injunction on us. They basically just said that would be wonderful because you have everything from Del Gamu in the court files and you would win. Is there a plan by Shell and company to bypass the British Ocean village? Uh, the question is, is there a plan by Shell and company to bypass uh, the village at Unison? Originally, just for to show that they were trying to find an alternative route. They did some minor adjustments, but it was still on Unistatan territory where they would said they would skirt around where a community that we've built up, they wanted to skirt around and go behind us. 
but we told them they still couldn't access. And then they said it was going to cost too much money. There never was no real plan to find a different route. They just wanted to do that to say that they did it. But they're still trying to push ahead with their original route. Awesome. Uh, get some rest. We'll, uh, we'll have Caitlin here introduce our last speaker of the night. Thank you so much, Rita. Take care up there. Good night. Um, good night. Good night. <laughs> good night. Uh, our next speech speaker was supposed to be Mark Lee from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Unfortunately, he is sick, so he's not able to join us. But the good news is uh, my colleague Jens Weeding has stepped in at the last minute and uh, can speak on the same topics that Mark was going to talk about. So Jens is a senior forest and climate campaigner with Sierra Club BC. He works hard to protect coastal old growth rainforest because they're special places because these big old trees won't grow back at, at, given climate change and because they, the big trees play a really important role in mitigating climate change as well. He follows the climate science really closely. He's a key part of our team that's advocating for the shift away from fossil fuels. I've had the great pleasure of working with Jens for many years and I'm really so grateful that he could step in at the last moment. Over to Jens. Caitlin, can you hear me okay? Um, thanks to all of you for, for caring for being here. You are giving me hope and, and we need hope because uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about climate and climate change is scary and, uh, and I'm honored to speak right after Frida. It's, uh, I'm also um, feeling privileged that we are working in solidarity with First Nations because climate change is a new form of colonialism and these decisions are impacting indigenous people and non-indigenous people globally. Um, one of my favorite journalists, David Roberts, he's writing for Vox, has a, um, a clip on YouTube and it's called Climate Change is Simple and fundamentally it's simple. We are burning more fossil fuels and we are, we are warming the planet more and we are still having to find new projects. That's crazy. It's very clear that there are only two directions. One direction is the one where we will increase emissions and the other direction is where we will reduce emissions. As long as we continue to build new projects, we are not even taking the first steps to getting off fossil fuels. And we really have to, to fight this. And there are times when it's really difficult to remain hopeful, but we need to be hopeful and we need courage. We need more courage than our leaders because they are in denial. So it's either the big lie that Mike referred to or a new form of climate denial. Uh, next slide, please. So Halloween <laughs> is, is only a few days ago um, and I thought I, I will keep this in because climate change is really scary, but again, we have to have the courage to, to look at the facts and, um, and force our leaders to accept the facts. Deny is not an option. Um, next one, please. So if this is too, too uh, crazy and too scary and undermining your feelings of hope, I recommend this article. The future hasn't already been decided. I'm going to talk briefly about the uh, latest IPCC report and some of that stuff is really scary, but Rebecca Solnit wrote this article for The Guardian and it's a really cool reminder that the future has not been decided. It still depends on our actions and on the actions of our governments, how those temperature curves, how those emissions curves and trajectories will, will unfold. Next one, please. So you all heard about the uh, IPCC report. Uh, um, Three important things I want to mention is that this is the first time that all these scientists have done work to understand with some detail the difference between 1.5 degrees of warming and 2 degrees of warming and the, the findings were very clear. 1.5 is really problematic and we really don't want to go to 2 degrees of warming because millions of people will be, um, will be at risk of, 
of flooding, of um, lack of access to food, uh, we will lose all coral reefs at two degrees, and the list goes on. That's number one. Secondly, on the current path, we will be at 1.5 degrees at around 2040. That's just 22 years away, and we have to stop the warming before 2040. And thirdly, we have to be at zero emissions around 2050. We have to be about halfway there around 2040. So delay is no longer an option. And the Canadian targets, the BC targets, are not consistent with, with these curves. And we have to force our governments to take action to reduce emissions. And we have to force our governments to have targets in place that can actually get us where we have to be. Otherwise, it's just another form of, of denial. Um, the next one, please. So there are lots of good things in the IPCC report. They have never done more detailed work that shows us exactly what we have to do. There are different pathways, like the, uh, P1 and P2, that show how emissions have to decrease, and there are some options how to um, restore our forests, protect our forests, to make sure that uh, um, we can actually also sequester some carbon from the atmosphere. But the most important thing we have to do is get off all fossil fuels everywhere without exception. And the next one, please. Um, this is one that I chose because it shows that methane also has to be reduced. Uh, this bizarre argument that we can switch from one fuel to another and use it as a bridge. There's nothing in the science that justifies that. It's about reducing all, all these emissions. There's one um, scenario that could be described as the only less risky one, P1, that clearly says that we have to reduce gas globally by 2030, by 25 percent, and then to 74 percent by 2050. So the reason why we are still supposedly allowed to have some, some gas globally around 2050 is that the assumption that forests will absorb some of the carbon. But these lines are all going down, and there's no footnote that says that Canada or BC can somehow increase these emissions and export these fuels to other countries. That's, um, that simply doesn't exist. The next one, please. Um, I, I just inserted this because maybe you need to find more information. And this is one article from an author called Joe Rom. And it's on Think Progress. And this one is the best summary. It, it has all the references and quickly summarizes science on how powerful, what a powerful greenhouse gas methane is, 68 times more powerful than carbon dioxide in the short term. The science and the findings that show how methane leakage is in fact much higher in the US than reported. We also know that the David Suzuki Foundation did excellent work showing that it's the same in BC, the emissions of the methane leakage in the Northeast is much higher than what is reflected in our provincial reports. And thirdly, if we export gas to other countries, it is competing with renewable energy and in some cases undermining the success of renewable energy and energy efficiency. And that's not a solution, that's a threat, that's endangering progress. Next one. Um, again, if you have to find more information, we have a fantastic a uh, writer here in BC writing for the uh, National Observer, Barry Saxonbridge, and he just did another one um, showing just how crazy emissions from LNG Canada alone will undermine our BC targets. Next one, please. So here we have on the left our current emissions, about the biggest factors I hear are transportation, people transportation, freight, other industry, natural gas industry. We already have a lot of emissions and the ballpark 10 million tons. And then our targets, 40% reduction by 2030 and then 2050 we're supposed to be at 80%. Again, the, those are weak targets, but it's very, very difficult to meet even those weak targets. We are now supposed to reduce our emissions by 37%. Another 37% are missing because in 
in more than 10 years, we have only reduced our emissions by 3%. Now we have 37% left to go in 12 years. That's really ambitious, and we cannot build new fossil fuel projects if we want to get there. Next one, please. Um, this is now showing what Energy Canada would do. Just in BC, there are even more emissions in other countries after exporting fossil fuels. Next one, please. And then we have more proposals. Kitimat Energy, for example. Next one. And then uh, we have now included our current natural gas industry, Energy Canada, if it goes ahead. Kismet Energy, now we have this Quispa project that is proposed for Vancouver Island. So clearly, this is mind-boggling stuff, and we have to force our governments to take a reality check. Next one, please. And just a quick reminder that we are creating a few jobs. We could create way more jobs investing in renewable energy, the uh, BC government uh, offered six billion giveaway to support Energy Canada. If we would use, and we have to use, similar efforts to support renewable energy, energy efficiency, we would create way more jobs and actually save our climate. And if we continue to invest in the wrong projects and offer subsidies for the wrong projects, we will not have the financial room to offer other better projects uh, that would actually allow us to reduce emissions. Next one, please. And so I'm closing soon here because we we don't have a lot of time. But I want to show this uh, a second time. I don't know why something is cut off here, but this is the IPCC um, report again, and we have to be at zero emissions mid-century, halfway there, um, around 2040. And we have to meet this challenge because, as Bill McKibben wrote in another great article, winning slowly is the same as losing. We have to do this now, not in 10 years, not in 20 years, because the carbon bathtub is full. and. We need action from our government to invest into solutions, stop investing into new fossil fuel projects. Next one, please. And I included this as my last one to maybe give you hope that this is possible because there have been lots of examples in human history where change came relatively suddenly when people are not giving up. And I chose this because I was uh, in Germany until 12 years ago, and I witnessed this amazing moment when the Berlin Wall came down. And I often think about this guy, Erich Honecker. He, he was the last leader of East Germany in 1989. And in September 1989, he said, the wall will stand in 50, even in 100 years. That was six weeks before the wall came down. <laughs> and when I hear, when I heard Stephen Harper about energy, power, and when I hear Horgan and Trudeau talking about Energy Canada, I think of about Erich Honecker because it's such a level of denial. We have this amazing progress in renewable energy, and we have this dangerous threat of global warming. And people will not take it much longer. We have so many climate impacts now that more and more people are getting it. And we have to continue this fight until we are stopping all those fossil fuel projects that are still being proposed. Thank you. We'll get to questions for Jens in just a moment. And Mike, if you could come back down, um, we'll do questions for, if you have more questions for Mike as well. I know we cut that off earlier. Um, but first, pull out your phones again. Here's another chance for action. 
Uh, there's a Sierra Club BC Action Center. It's the website is Sierra Club, all one word, sierraclub.bc.ca slash LNG. And we have an action calling on the BC government to strengthen the climate targets um, and to stop subsidizing LNG. They're trying to, you know, they want to subsidize LNG Canada to the tune of six billion, six billion dollars. So Sierra Club bc.ca slash lng please uh, get your phones out and take the action and while you're doing that you can stay up here Jens questions for Jens and for Mike uh, in the green and then in the um, in my reading of the um, uh, the uh, um, climate change the new climate change report uh, they say that since uh, the Paris Accord was adopted in uh, December of 2015, the Canada's targets now are 50% too low. Uh, you can call now. Yeah, that's a, that's about right. Um, there is a new paper out a few days ago in the Guardian uh, reported about with the headline that uh, Canada. Russia, a third country, I think Canada, Russia and the US have currently policies in place that are essentially a blueprint for five degrees of warming by 2100. Um, so, and it's relatively straightforward, right? Because if, um, if we continue with the current BC and, and Canadian targets, which are about 80% reduction by 2050, and also weaker targets by 2030, 2040 than what is needed. We are using way more of the remaining carbon budget than what is possible. And we are one of the uh, highest per capita emitters. So it's very, very unfair um, to begin with uh, as um, a rich country with very high per capita emissions and with a history of polluting the planet compared to other countries that only recently started to pollute the atmosphere, we have an even higher responsibility to move faster to get off fossil fuels and stop exporting fossil fuels to other countries. Big round of applause again to both, yeah. And uh, just wanted to say thanks again you know, to everybody who came out. Uh, we hope this event shine some light on some of the truths that uh, the LNG industry and the British Columbia government are hiding. And um, we may have a couple cookies left for folks to take on their way out, uh, but we do have to clear the space pretty quickly. We've got to be able to get all the chairs out and tables in. Um, so uh, yeah, just have yourselves a great night. And remember, sign uh, the petition to ban fracking and write a letter to the British Columbia government if you can. And uh, support the industry. Thanks.